Standing by in Adelaide is Trade Minister Simon Birmingham. Thanks for joining us and welcome back to Australia. Great to be with you, Annabelle. Let's go to these developments overnight at the G20, the conclusion of the talks between Presidents Trump and Xi. Are you satisfied that this is a genuine de-escalation to trade hostilities? Well, as President Xi has said himself, uh, dialogue is always better than confrontation. Uh, and what we're seeing here at least is a commitment to dialogue. Uh, we take at face value the positive comments coming from both President Trump and President Xi that there is going to be genuine dialogue and that there are genuine efforts to try to resolve these trade tensions. Uh, we heard very clearly from the IMF uh, leaders at the G20 about the impact that these trade tensions are having on global economic growth and that if the threatened increases on, in tariffs were to have been applied, uh, that would have seen a further deterioration markedly from 3.6% down to 3.1% in terms of projected rates of global economic growth. So averting that uh, is an important first step. Uh, clearly we want to see a structural permanent resolution and we hope that the parties can get to that point. Obviously President Trump <coughs> has retreated on his threat to impose further tariffs and he's um, liberalised trade with the uh, controversial company Huawei. Uh, but he also said in his lengthy press conference that the Chinese government had agreed to buy, quote, a tremendous amount of food and agricultural product from American farmers. Do you understand what that means? Well, we'll be watching very closely in that space. Uh, what we want to see is that any agreement between China and the United States uh, is compliant with the basic rules of the World Trade Organisation that allows countries to compete. Uh, we'll back Australia's farmers and businesses to compete on fair terms with anybody, but we don't want to see uh, a managed outcome uh, that sees a particular contracts struck in a way negotiated between governments that, uh, that cut away opportunities for farmers or businesses from other countries such as ours to be able to compete fairly. Uh, so we'll see exactly the terms there. Well, we President, also hope President that some Trump, of the... President Trump, excuse me, said um, that he was writing a shopping list for what the Chinese would be buying from American farmers. Aren't Australian, let's say, wheat farmers entitled to feel a bit concerned about an agreement that sounds like this one sounds? Let's see exactly what comes out of it, but our, our position is clear and it's been publicly and privately put to, for some period of time now, and that is we want to see outcomes that, as I said, are WTO compliant, uh, that enable countries to compete, uh, that we back our farmers and businesses to compete, uh, but it's got to be uh, the type of fair playing field, not managed outcomes that could be to the detriment uh, of that reasonable competition between uh, players, farmers, businesses uh, from other countries. Now, uh, we also hope that some of the structural issues uh, will be successfully addressed in this, and by that I mean some of those issues around technology transfer and intellectual property protection, uh, which are, uh, are important issues uh, that were at the heart of this, uh, but it is on the whole, when you take a long-term perspective, good news that we're not seeing a further escalation of trade tensions. Uh, but we'll keep an eye on the detail uh, and be monitoring that very, very closely. Now, the US tariffs on steel and aluminium, from which Australia, of course, famously was exempted, have actually worked out pretty well for us. The exports of Australian aluminium were up 350% in the first quarter of this year in a development that reportedly horrified US officials. Earlier this month, there was some talk that that exemption might be reviewed. Do you have any news from us, for us uh, from the G20 on that front? We had great discussions uh, with, uh, with the United States administration and particularly the discussions between Prime Minister Morrison and President Trump. Uh, the arrangements that were struck uh, previously, uh, we understand, will continue. Uh, we're working to make sure that all aspects of those arrangements, including uh, ensuring that there aren't surges of Australian exports into the US in those categories where we've got the tariff exemption, uh, are on it. Uh, and we're working closely with companies to, uh, to deliver uh, outcomes there that uh, preserve that agreement uh, and we don't expect to see, based on the discussions we've had, any changes to the terms of that agreement. So when you say that you understand that that agreement will be continued. Is that just a vibe thing or have you had an explicit undertaking to that effect? No, well, you, I mean, everybody heard the remarks the President made uh, before we sat down to, uh, to dinner uh, in Osaka uh, and the President there was very clear that we've worked through those, uh, those issues uh, and we have worked through them. We'll keep uh, making sure that we address them from uh, our end, uh, but we are quite confident uh, that the agreements that were in place will continue. Uh, President Trump also relinquished the hardline um, stance on the company Huawei. Given how hard Australia's gone, does that softening of the position worry you? 
Uh, look, again, let's see the detail there. Uh, Australia's position uh, has been about uh, the construction of a 5G network uh, and ensuring that as our 5G network is constructed, uh, it is protected from uh, any companies, from any countries uh, where they may be subject to uh, direct influence or interference potentially from those countries. Now, uh, in terms of the United States, uh, there are uh, broader issues that have been put on the table previously by President Trump, not just isolated to 5G network construction. He may be taking some of those issues off the table. Uh, we're not clear on that, but again, uh, we'll work closely with the administration and monitor those circumstances. Now, modern communications technology will have enabled you to keep in touch with developments in Australia while you were in Osaka, and uh, of course there have been a rash of revelations about certain events last August. Now, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison has always avowed that the um, spill had nothing to do with him, but it now seems very clear that the reason that the initial vote for Peter Dutton in August last year was so high was that Peter Mo Mor that um, Scott Morrison's personal backers voted for him. That's clear, isn't it? Look, Annabelle, there's lots of commentary around uh, around those events. I realise people such as Nikki, who's on the panel today, have been uh, diligently writing books to uh, to go over the history of that. Um, that's a matter for history. Uh, for those of us who continue as members of the government, our responsibility is to be working for the Australian people for the future, uh, not to be reflecting on the past. Well, of the 7.5 billion people currently on the planet today, you're in about the top five in a position to comment on this. So you were doing uh, Malcolm Turnbull's numbers at the time. Do you agree with the proposition that that initial vote would not have been as damaging for Mr Turnbull had Scott Morrison's backers not been a part of it? Look, I have complete confidence that Scott Morrison uh, did everything he possibly could to support uh, Malcolm Turnbull. As for individual votes in the party room, uh, we are a, a Liberal Party in which every individual MP and Senator is responsible for their own vote. Much as any of us may try to influence those votes from time to time, each individual is responsible for their vote. I'm confident that Scott uh, did what he could to continue to support Malcolm right through that process. I mean, a discussion of these matters, looking backwards on them, uh, it doesn't really serve anybody's purposes. I feel, frankly, sad when I think back to the distractions that occurred at the time, the disruption that occurred at the time. Uh, Malcolm is a very valued friend and somebody who I believe has exceptional characteristics and abilities that he used to advance uh, opportunities for our nation. Uh, but in the end, the Australian people drew a line under all of these matters, uh, certainly on the May the 18th, uh, when they re-elected the Liberal National Coalition, when they gave Scott Morrison a mandate and endorsement in his own right. Uh, and Scott, we've seen with the outcomes at the G20 in relation to countering violent extremism online, is out there getting results for Australia and doing a cracking job, not only for the Liberal and National Parties, but for all Australians. So you think it was plausible that Mr Morrison's backers were acting without his knowledge? As I say, each and every individual member of the Liberal Party room is responsible for their vote in those circumstances and uh, none of us uh, can claim responsibility uh, or expect to be able to direct the votes of any one of our colleagues. You're about to move into a, a new Senate where, again, Finance Minister Matthias Cormann has the lead role in negotiations with the crossbench. Um, if these crossbenchers have read Nikki Sava's book, they're entitled to feel a bit skeptical about any assurances they get from Senator Cormann uh, now, aren't they? I think uh, the crossbenchers, especially those who've been dealing with Matthias, with the broader Senate leadership, with the government uh, over many years now, uh, know that when we strike deals with them, uh, we honour them. Uh, but you know, when we're sitting down in this new Senate, what we want to see first and foremost is the Labor Party acknowledge the result of the election that was had on May the 18th. Uh, you've got uh, seemingly Mr Albanese completely tone deaf to the fact we had an election, which was a stark contrast between the coalition arguing for lower taxes, Labor arguing for higher taxes. The result, a coalition win, uh, and all we are seeking to do at present is to get on with implementing the promises that we made to the Australian people when it comes to having lower taxes and delivering on those. Uh, and it is so reckless and irresponsible of Labor to stand in the way uh, of our government delivering on those promises of lowering income taxes for hard-working Australians. You did campaign very strongly on lowering income taxes. In fact, um, Prime Minister Scott Morrison swore black and blue that millions of Australians would have their first round of tax cuts by today, the 30th of June. Well, today's arrived and they haven't been delivered. Do you owe all of those taxpayers an apology for the broken promise? What we owe all of those taxpayers is exactly what we promised them, which is that they would get 
uh, $1,080 per person in many cases as a result of the increase in the low and middle income tax offset and that they're going to get that uh, in their tax returns as they are lodged through uh, the coming months. And now there might be a week or two's delay in terms of the legislation passing from what would have been optimal, but ultimately we want to make sure people get every cent, every dollar that we're promised. We're committed to doing that. Uh, and the Labor Party need to end the verbal gymnastics about exactly what their final position will be. Our position is clear. We are bringing to the parliament exactly the tax relief legislation that we promised before the election, and we will seek to legislate it exactly in that form. You There'll be no negotiations, no deviations from that. Labor should be clear that when we reject any and all attempts from them to vary what we promised the Australian people, Will they, at the final vote, let that tax relief go through so those Australians can get that extra $1,080 for low and middle income earners now and so that ultimately we can see uh, the 32.5 cent in the dollar tax rate reduced down to 30 cents in the dollars for people earning upwards of $45,000? You seem very confident of getting this wrapped up within a week or two. Do you think it's more likely that the Labor Party will fold or that you'll get a deal with the crossbench? Look, we want to work with whoever is willing to pass this, uh, but it is a stain on the Labor Party that will last all the way through to the next election if they block and vote against tax relief for hard-working Australians. Uh, now, uh, what we know is that they say they're going to try to amend this and put an alternate proposal forward. Not an alternate proposal that they took to the election, mind you. So they're saying they won't support the proposal that the government well, took to the election. They'll come around your way of thinking. They're they want putting to bring some the other sort of proposal forward. forward. Let's actually just acknowledge that the Australian people spoke and they expect the government elected to deliver on the promises that we made and that's what we're seeking to do. have tax cuts in place by today. OK, so... Um, have, no, but, but people are going to get every single dollar, Annabelle. Whether it comes a week or two later, they're going to get every single dollar as long as this legislation passes and it will pass faster if the Labor Party support it. One more question before we run out of time, and that's about the uh, new job of Christopher Pine, your for former colleague who's moved to EY as a defence consultant. Mm. Given that the Ministerial Code of Conduct prohibits ministers from working in the fields of their portfolios within 18 months of leaving it, this is a pretty open and shut breach, isn't it? Well, I trust that Christopher uh, will work in a way that is uh, in keeping with the ministerial statement on standards and conduct. Uh, I trust that he will be mindful of that, uh, that, uh, that the uh, job that he's taken uh, doesn't engage in lobbying in relation to defence activities uh, and, of course, that he sticks uh, by the letter of it as well as the principle Well, the Ministerial it. Code obliges him not to lobby, not have meetings, not talk to anyone and not use any of the knowledge that he's accumulated in the portfolio. Doesn't make him much of an employee if he can't do any of those things, does it? Well, it's a matter between him and Ernst and & Young, uh, but uh, as I said, we expect that everybody should ad adhere to that code of conduct, and that includes Christopher. Thanks very much for your time, Simon Birmingham. Thank you, Annabelle.